Bladder cancer has long been considered a disease of older men. And in 2022, the American Cancer Society estimates that more than 81,000 individuals in the United States will be diagnosed with bladder cancer. And of those, about 19,480 will be women. And though it's more prevalent in men, studies have shown that women are more likely to present at a much more advanced stage and usually after a delay in their diagnosis. And according to a report published by the National Cancer Institute, um, survival rates for women with bladder cancer tends to lag behind that of men at all stages of disease. And African-American women in particular have poorer outcomes when they're diagnosed with bladder cancer. Beacon is very delighted to welcome four female urology experts who specialize in treating bladder cancer. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Seema Porton, a longtime member of our scientific advisory board who treats patients at the University of California in San Francisco. So welcome, Dr. Porton. And then Dr. Ann Shookman from the Keck Medical Center at the University of Southern California. And then from Vanderbilt Health in Nashville, Tennessee, Dr. Kristen Scarpato. And then coming in from Albany Medical Center, Dr. Svetlana Avilova. So we really have covered the country. And now I know you wanna hear what these experts have to say. So I'm going to go and turn off my camera and just listen. But don't forget, if you have questions, drop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of our screen. Thanks so much. Have a great program. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm uh, really delighted uh, to be spending this time with great friends and colleagues and all of you on behalf of Beacon. Um, as uh, Stephanie said, my name is Seema Porton. I'm an associate professor at UCSF and a urologic oncologist. I think uh, we'll just go ahead and jump right on in. I appreciate everybody submitting questions beforehand. And of course, feel free to submit questions into the, into the chat. Um, into the Q&A box and um, either we'll take them as they come or if we don't get, get to them as we're talking and discussing, we'll do them at the end. And so I'm gonna start with Dr. Scarpato. I think Stephanie described really nicely the a little bit about the incidence of bladder cancer and some of the disparities that we um, <clears throat> that are reported in the literature and that we've also uh, noticed clinically. Uh, what do you think are some of the challenges in diagnosing women uh, with bladder cancer? And um, tell me a little bit about some of the um, exposures or causes for bladder cancer and how that may differ between um, men and women. Thank you, Seema. I just want to reiterate that it is really exciting to be here with this amazing group of female urologic oncologists. And thank you all for joining and thank you to, to BCAN. I wanna just start by highlighting again, some of the information you heard to start off this webinar about the incidence of bladder cancer. I think it's always important to start thinking about the big picture. So from an incidence standpoint, you heard earlier that over 81,000 new cases of bladder cancer will be diagnosed in the US this year. That's making it the sixth most common cancer diagnosed. And of that number, over close to 20,000 deaths will be attributed to bladder cancer. Patients tend to present at an older age. The median age of diagnosis is around 73. But when we look a little bit more in depth and think about males versus females, of that over 81,000, about 20,000 will be female. So that accounts for about 25% of the diagnoses. But about 30% of the deaths from bladder cancer occur in women compared to men. And so when we look even more in depth at these uh, gender disparities, some of what um, you heard earlier is a little bit alarming. Women tend to have worse outcomes stage for stage when compared to men. And women are more likely to have a higher stage at presentation than men. And overall, bladder cancer has a worse prognosis in women than men. And this is true for both non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and muscle invasive bladder cancer. About 75% of bladder cancer is non-muscle invasive at bladder at diagnosis compared to about 25% being muscle invasive. So there are a couple of reasons that um, we can talk about for why this might be, 
but I wanted to highlight, as uh, Seema asked, some of the risk factors for bladder cancer. Uh, so as I said before, male gender and certainly age are, are risk factors. We don't often see patients younger than 40 being diagnosed with bladder cancer. That doesn't mean that it can't happen. Smoking is a major risk factor. I often will say to patients, the number one, two, and three risk factor for bladder cancer is smoking. And overall in the United States, the rates of smoking have decreased significantly, which is great to see. Um, generally men are using tobacco products more commonly than women are. It's about 15% of males to about 10 to 11% of women smokers. But that gap, that, that difference between men and women who are smokers is getting a little bit smaller. So that's something I think we need to pay attention to. And smoking cessation is a really important part of what urologists do, because when patients stop smoking, they decrease their risk of bladder cancer. And so that's important. Another risk factor, and this may be something that's particularly important in women, is chronic inflammation or infection. We know that the lining of the bladder reacts to chronic inflammation or infection, and one of the consequences of that can be the development of cancerous changes. And so we never want to ignore chronic infections or recurrent urinary tract infection in women. There's um, important data about environmental exposures beyond tobacco smoke, and that can be related to um, certain industrial exposures or dyes, um, patient, patients who are hairdressers or uh, working with certain caustic chemicals um, or textiles can be at increased risk for, for bladder cancer. Any history of radiation to the pelvis. Um, so we think about patients who have had radiation for um, cervical cancer or other pelvic cancers can be at increased risk in the bladder. And then medications like cyclophosphamide, that is an agent that is utilized to treat certain cancers. And that medication is processed by the kidneys and excreted in the urine and can cause some significant changes in the bladder, irritation and um, something called hemorrhagic cystitis or um, basically blood and urine that can be really significant. And that inflammation, like I alluded to before, can be associated with an increased risk of bladder cancer as well. But, and importantly, that gender disparity in bladder cancer persists, even when you account for these um, exposures in, in our patients, we know that that disparity continues. And so um, undoubtedly the, the epidemiology of bladder cancer, I think, contributes to the delay to the differences we see between men and women. You have to be thinking about a particular disease to be able to, to diagnose it. Um, so we have to consider bladder cancer in all of our patients who present with blood in the urine, either microscopic blood in the urine or gross blood in the urine, or patients who have recurrent urinary tract infections or significant lower urinary tract symptoms. And unfortunately, there's a bunch of data, a large amount of data that shows that the evaluation of, of men in different, particularly men and women, is different, particularly when we're looking at microscopic hematuria evaluation. And so I would charge all primary care doctors and OBGYNs and urologists, um, all clinicians out there to be thinking about bladder cancer in our female patients, even though they don't fit into that old white male um, descriptor that, that Stephanie mentioned before. And I would also encourage patients to be thinking about it too. I think we as women tend to power through things all the time and um, you know, certain symptoms and signs really should not be ignored. And so I want everyone to feel empowered and comfortable speaking to their provider about any symptoms that are concerning for, for bladder cancer. So um, to get to a couple more things that um, Dr. Porton asked about, um, certainly there's this delay in diagnosis that can contribute to the differences between men and women, but there's also evidence to show that um, there may be hormonal differences between men and women that may contribute to 
the development of cancer, particularly bladder cancer. And so I think that's being investigated a little bit further. Um, and women also are more likely to present with what we call variant histology or non urothelial carcinoma. And so that tends to react a little bit differently and respond not as well to our standard therapies, both for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and muscle invasive bladder cancer. And that's a really important consideration. And so, you know, what, what can we do about this? How can we improve on this? And I think having webinars like this is a perfect example. So again, I just want to thank the, the Beacon for um, putting this together to raise awareness and to advocate for women. And so I want to highlight just one more thing before turning it back to Seema, if that's okay. Um, you know, there are some, some new guidelines for microscopic hematuria that came out from the American Urological Association. And they really highlight the importance of evaluating both men and women for non-malignant and malignant causes of potential blood of blood in the urine. And these guidelines risk stratify patients according to things like age, number of blood cells in the urine, smoking history. And so guidelines, I think, can be an important part of moving forwards and making good decisions for our patients, hopefully to not miss any cancers. Yeah, and I think um, you bring up a good point with the with our new um, urologic guidelines. And I think the other important um, aspect of those that was kind of um, heard was the the need for collaboration with other uh, primary care providers for women, right? Our PCPs, but also with our um, gynecology colleagues. And so it was great that we saw that those guidelines were done in collaboration with some of these other um, large medical groups, because hopefully that will help with dissemination. And that will, again, raise awareness so that we can take out this um, aspect of delay in, in diagnosis. Um, so thank you for that wonderful overview um, of, of sort of setting the stage for the for to, to move along with the rest of the conversation. And so once um, a, a woman is diagnosed with bladder cancer, I, I wanted to pick your guys' brains about discussing how you discuss treatment options. So let's start with um, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Do you guys have any different considerations regarding treatment with ECG or intravesical therapy? Um, would you counsel a woman different from a man uh, in, in, with regards to these treatments. And then we, we can move on next to, um, uh, considerations for muscle invasive bladder cancer, but I wanted to, uh, start with, um, Dr. Shuckman and sort of what she does in practice. Hi, thanks Seema. And again, thanks to everybody for allowing me to participate in this panel today. Um, so for non-muscle invasive, I, I wouldn't say that I counsel men and women differently with regard to what treatments I offer at what time. And I think um, exactly what those treatments are isn't really the focus of our discussion today. Um, but I, I think that there are, as far as I know, really no different you know, sort of gender-related responses with non-muscle invasive disease, whether it's high-grade papillary disease or carcinoma in situ with men and women. Um, completely anecdotally, I guess, some things that may be a little different in practice are not so much with BCG, um, but with some of the intravesical chemotherapies, I do worry a little bit about some of the... Um, um, skin toxicity, particularly with things like mitomycin, um, if a woman has some incontinence. So I worry, you know, with men, generally they're not going to leak that out, or it's a lot easier to control if they can't detain the, um, the therapy in their bladder for the hour. And with women, I worry a lot about the skin being irritated. And I think I'm a lot more cautious about sort of cleaning the skin or advising women to really like clean, you know, clean around the labia so they don't end up with skin rashes. Um, and even more anecdotally, I have had more women complain about hair loss um, when they're receiving intravesical gemcitabine in particular. And I don't know if that's related to maybe like thinner bladders in women and more systemic absorption, or maybe women are just more aware of their hair, honestly. 
Um, but we're putting together a series at our institution about women who have had, you know, that kind of systemic um, a side effect actually from the intravesical therapy. And I don't hear that as much from the men. So again, pretty anecdotal, but but not insignificant. Yeah, I think um, the I worry a little bit about the extra toxicity on the skin too. So our um, infusion center nurses have uh, barrier cream mm -hmm. uh, available to sort of help, particularly in women who kind of talk that talk about having a hard time with continence. And so they can they they sort of counsel and, and they'll help put that on before um, someone gets to go home, hopefully to protect the skin a little bit. I think another big question that had come from a couple of my patients is, 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 is our counseling regarding um, when it's okay for sexual activity uh, while you're on intravesical treatment, because in general, we counsel men to wear barrier protection for at least a week after the last treatment, because we know that BCG hangs around the periurethral glands for about a, um, a week or so. But I don't know, I, I'm not aware of any data of that um, uh, being reported in women. However, we, we recommend that in terms of the same um, precautions. And I don't know if you guys have any insights into that. And I know a lot of this is anecdotal and things that we kind of encounter in practice and learn from our patients, but I still think it's valuable in terms of thinking, okay, you know, we still use guideline-based treatment. It's really important to get patients diagnosed on time and started on that type of therapy, but maybe there's some nuances in, in sort of what we talk about and do, do clinically. Um, any thoughts from either Dr. Avalova or Scarpata? I mean, I think that's a real, real concern that we we have to be aware of. I mean, besides, um, you know, like a, a dental dam protection for the vagina and the and the vulva, I, I'm not aware of any barrier protection um, available. I do think that. Um, maybe in general, like abstaining from penetrative intercourse for a week, just just as a sort of good rule of thumb probably is safe, um, but I'm not aware of any data and I haven't had that question pop up yet, but I think it's a fascinating one. Yeah, I agree. And I think it points to the fact that it's important to talk about this and the fact that none of us have had this question come up. Um, I think also sort of says a lot, but we definitely need more data and we need to make sure that we all feel comfortable talking about things like this because we know that patients are going to have questions about it, whether or not they verbalize them. Awesome. So, um, so Seema, do oh, you want ahead. to, there, there's an interesting question, I think, in the, in the um, chat from mm -hmm. uh, um, Christine Kang talking about sort of um, medications that we can use related to cystitis, um, chemical cystitis during BCG therapy, aside from peridium and anticholinergics. So, no, so I was curious if anybody had any comments on that. Um, it struck me that, you know, lots of providers, and I think Dr. Porton can speak to this specifically, are looking at things like, like acupuncture, you know, related to BCG therapy, and I and, uh, thought that might be interesting to mention in this portion of our talk. Yeah, for, for sure. I can um, comment on that. So I, I think in managing um, uh, BCG cystitis for both women and men, you know, we have our usual dose, dose reduction uh, strategy, um, doing two out of the three maintenance uh, aspects, and many are having to give reduced dose anyways, because of the shortage, right? Um, and, and a less of a holding time in terms of um, maintaining efficacy, all of those are valid ways of um, hopefully reducing BCG toxicity while still maintaining efficacy. Um, you know, our, there's also the thoughts of, of, of um, fluoroquinolone antibiotics day before, day of, day after. Not a lot of people use it in practice, but it's not really purported in any of our, our guidelines. We tend to use um, uh, also some complementary and alternative medicine techniques mindful-based strategies uh, at University of Washington, Dr. Sukha is actually looking at acupuncture uh, specifically at trying to manage lower urinary tract symptoms. And we tend to rely on um, posterior ne uh, tibial nerve stimulation mm -hmm. um, that many of our uh, uh, female urologists and neurourologists do to kind of manage side effects. And, and 
uh, for anyone sort of struggling with, with BCG. I think um, we can, I wanted to move on over into specifically talking about muscle invasive bladder cancer. And um, uh, back to you, Anne, in terms of anything different that you discuss or talk about in terms of um, counseling with regards to treatment or surgery planning um, from that aspect? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I would say almost the entire conversation is different for me with women patients than it is with male patients when it comes to talking about radical cystectomy. Um, and that really comes down to, I think, real differences in functional outcomes with um, the different types of reconstruction in men and women. So um, I think that the conversation, you know, for me always starts with talking about, okay, where are we from a cancer perspective and what are our oncologic options? And so um, that really starts with a good exam and figuring out, you know, where is the tumor in the bladder? What is it involving? And kind of what is, what is it that actually needs to come out as opposed to what is just sort of the like traditional way to do a cystectomy. Um, so I think that's the first step, you know, figuring out is the vagina involved with disease um, and, and, um, and, or, and, or can it be preserved? Um, I think the second step and probably more important long-term is really talking about what functional outcomes are important to a patient going forward. And that's really divided into two major categories, which are, um, you know, sort of the urinary functional outcomes and then um, sexual function outcomes and, and maybe thirdly, you know, sort of overall lifestyle functional outcomes. And those are all really big categories. Um, so when we talk about urinary diversion options in women, we first have to figure out um, whether somebody is a candidate for a continent diversion and whether that can be to the urethra where you just urinate out the normal way or whether it could be a continent diversion um, to something like the uh, skin or to the belly button where you catheterize through the belly button. And um, kind of figuring out that difference first between whether somebody wants to have a continent diversion or to use a urostomy bag where, where the urine just flows out into the bag is the first major difference. Um, and women do really differently than men with continent diversions. So, you know, we know that most men are able to just urinate with their neobladder, but for women, about half of women will have to catheterize if they have a neobladder. And so I think that's a really, really big question that women have to consider. And, and generally, you know, most people have a pretty strong opinion about it right away in my, in my experience. Um, so I tell women who are considering a neobladder, if we think that's an option, like you almost have to assume you're going to catheterize and are you going to be able to do that through the urethra? And I find many women say, well, that might be kind of tricky, but I'd be happy to catheterize through my belly button. That seems easy. Um, so I think that's a pretty different conversation than with women than it is with men, um, for me. And then the second part of the conversation really is about, well, what actually needs to come out in this surgery? And, you know, historically um, for women having cystectomies, the uterus would come out, the vagina, the ovaries, everything. And, and now we know that really for, you know, most patients, um, there's only about a, like two to 3% chance that those what we call female organs um, would be actually involved with the cancer. And that there are several series showing that those organs can be very safely spared from a cancer perspective without running the risk of cancer coming back. Um, and again, we have to know exactly what the cancer stage is and where it is. Uh, but I think that it's, it's really important to talk about one, is this an option? And two, you know, kind of what does that mean? Is it important to women or not? Um, so that's a, it's a very large portion of the conversation. And we know that, that sparing those organs can have a big impact down the road, both on functional outcomes in terms of how well you can control your urine, how well you can void, obviously sexual outcomes, if we're able to spare those organs have been definitely shown to be better. If women, um, have a vagina that's preserved, it's a lot easier to have penetrative intercourse, um, down the road, if that's something that's important to them. Um, so I, that, that's a wide and broad overview, but I think that's kind of a start and maybe we can go from here. Yeah. Thank you for, thank you for sharing that. 
Um, I wanted to take one pause before we move on to talk a little bit more about sexual function. And I and that's where I really want to get Dr. Avalova's thoughts on that, as she's done a lot of really cool research, both in the immediate um, setting and the later setting. But one question that came up in the Q&A that I thought was um, also really great is, is that uh, what is the role of genetic testing um, in in women in terms of um, especially those that are diagnosed at a young age and then also just across the the spectrum um, I think from my personal experience of course there's Lynch syndrome that we always that that I think about is particularly when you take a family history and there's a lot of colon cancers and endometrial cancers and others that you sort of see dispersed throughout relatives um, although Lynch syndrome is um, more directly related to uh, uh, tumors of the lining of the ureter or the lining of the kidney, um, I think we're seeing a lot more patients with um, also uh, tumors of the lower tract and in the bladder. But um, how do you how do you guys uh, manage that, or or how do you refer? For me, I I offer almost every patient. Um, genetic testing, or at least a meeting with our genetic counselors, um, because of telehealth and now the ability to do these Zoom uh, visits, particularly at UCSF, it's been a really, it's opened up the ability to kind of have that conversation and for them to be able to send these home testing saliva kits. Um, and so we've been taking advantage of that uh, a lot more. I know there's some emerging data um, particularly from the group at Memorial Sloan Kettering, but I know this is a lot more geared toward folks in with ad, advanced disease. I'd be curious to see how what you guys are doing. I think that urologists have become a lot more facile, fortunately, with um, talking about genetic syndromes, talking about genetic testing, and um, health systems in general have become a lot more equipped with genetic counselors readily available and um, referral systems in place via telehealth or in person. And so certainly the importance of taking a thorough family history cannot be understated. Um, and then, you know, referring when appropriate and sometimes um, even collaborating with colleagues in medical oncology who have um, also a great awareness and um, it can be very helpful about certain syndromes that I might not be thinking about. But Lynch is always the, the first one that I think about with bladder cancer patients. Yeah, I would agree. I think a strong uh, multidisciplinary approach in collaboration with our uh, medical oncology partners. I often you know, tell patients who are much younger than expected that we need to consider genetic testing right away. And often even before they even think of that question. Um, and they appreciate that, that thoroughness and that, um, um, that sort of forward thinking. Thanks. Um, so again, I wanted to, um, I think uh, Dr. Shuckman, you brought up really, really great points when we're looking at um, uh, counseling patients who are facing this uh, pretty, pretty large operation. And I kind of wanted to move on to what about after in terms of um, sexual health, sexual function. And I really wanted to get um, Svetlana your thoughts about that. And, and um, what do you, what do you think is important in terms of considerations and sort of what is your um, uh, recent research kind of taught you and what should we be aware of? Yeah, thank you so much um, for that and for Beacon again for hosting this and um, Stephanie for getting us all together again. Um, so I think it's really important to set the stage from the beginning, um, you know, to bring up um, whether women have any issues even before any treatment in terms of sexual function. A lot of them do, but are just afraid to bring it up um, and sort of understand what those issues are. Um, before any surgery is done. So a lot of women who are unfortunately diagnosed are postmenopausal. Oftentimes they have genitourinary syndrome of menopause. They have associated vaginal atrophy and uh, dyspareunia. So they may not even be, you know, engaging in penetrative intercourse to begin with. Um, 
let alone because of the anxiety of having a bladder cancer diagnosis or any um, side effects from treatments thereafter. So important to set the stage, important to find out what their baseline function is, and then um, kind of understand where where their interests are and, and kind of the, the level of importance of sexual activity is for them. Um, most of them will say like, oh, my partner's not interested or my partner has erectile dysfunction. And so, um, or sometimes they can be very shy and just think that we don't want to hear them say that they're sexually active because maybe it's their age or just their upbringing. And so again, normalizing that um, sexual activity for women, all ages is important. It's vital to their health and, um, and that they can talk to us about this. And so then once you set the stage and you kind of tell them what the options are, as Dr. Shuckman so eloquently sort of outlined for us, you know, um, bring up the fact that they are uh, surgical considerations that would have to be made at the time of these invasive surgeries. Um, and, and then, um, you know, work with our colleagues in, um, in our uh, female urology groups, in our gynecology groups, our psychotherapy colleagues. Um, there are wonderful resources in terms of understanding the availability of sex therapists in the region, um, looking at the different um, societies and availability of, of these sex therapists. So one, one organization that comes to mind is Ishwish, uh, which is the International Society um, for uh, uh, sexuality for women. And so I feel like I always butcher that acronym, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you can, you can easily look that up online and you can find a sex therapist at the discretion and privacy of your own computer um, and um, find out if there are resources available to speak to someone again, whether it's before surgery, after surgery, but having that conversation and engaging our patients. In addition, there's some topical um, treatments that we can provide for vaginal atrophy, and that can start even before you do the surgery. So vaginal estrogen, um, DHEA uh, suppositories, um, where again, if some women have a history of breast cancer diagnosis, or they may be wary of any um, estrogen with systemic absorption, you know, DHEA is a viable option for improving um, vaginal epithelialization. And the, the, what I like to tell women, you know, just as when we get older, our skin gets thinner, the skin around the vagina gets thinner, and it's okay to, to give it a little bit of love in terms of these um, wonderful therapies. Can I just jump in for one second and of course. say- Yes. How awesome this work is. I haven't been a urologic oncologist for all that long. And to see since 2014, when I finished residency to now, the market change that has occurred around this discussion is huge. And this was not something that I was trained in as a resident and it hasn't, hasn't been that long. And I think all of our practices have benefited from the work that Svetlana and others like Svetlana have done and the discussion around this important issue. It, it's quality of life is important and sexual health is part of quality of life. And um, I'm so glad to see that this um, is an important part of counseling and, and planning for our patients today. Yeah, and I, and I also um, think it's really heartening to see that the, um, that some of the therapies, because we did, we, we were talking about some of the different hormonal uh, differences that in terms of its interaction with bladder cancer. And I think that's a lot more complex um, than, than um, maybe first realized. Right. And so um, a little bit of the fear of that, some of these therapies, which are hormonally based can really help quality of life. Um, and, and how you reconcile that with uh, some of these signals that we're seeing. And I think there's a question from Carrie um, that talks about like, what are some of the hormonal differences that, that may uh, cause bladder cancer? And a, a lot of patients ask me this question. And I usually say that it's, it's all about the, the time point that you're looking at, right? So when we talk about 
what hormonal differences cause you to develop a cancer and particularly bladder cancer, there is data on this that actually um, doesn't really show like a very strong link. And so uh, looking at like and um, the nurses, the huge nurses health study, uh, a, a group, um, a multidisciplinary group sort of uh, looked at, well, based on the time your period starts, how many um, when, when menopause starts, how many children you've had, did you take hormonal replacement therapy? Did you take birth control? When you look at all of those factors and you try to say, does estrogen exposure in any of these different varying ways affect if you develop bladder cancer, there doesn't seem to be a strong link. Our, our home, hormonal relationship with bladder cancer um, uh, tends to be more well studied in when it's um, uh, when it's on the kind of worst side or metastatic side in terms of what are the different responses to therapies and can we use hormonal agents um, to help in the treatment of patients, something like tamoxifen and, and that. So I think it's, I think we're just getting into some of this and it's a lot more complex than, than I would say we know. And I'd say we, we haven't really found strong links yet, a lot of associations, but it's really heartening to see all the work um, done. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts specifically on that question. I know it's jumping back a little. <laughs> I, I don't on that question, but I, I did want to make a comment on um, what uh, Dr. Avalobo was discussing because she's doing all this great work. And this is just sort of like going back to basics. You know, we want to encourage patients to talk about like what their baseline function is and we want to talk about all this great stuff about what we can do surgically, you know, potentially to spare spare the possibility of function in organs. But I guess one thing that comes to my mind that comes up all the time in clinic is, you know, we go through this cystectomy and like three months down the road, patients are finally feeling pretty good and they've gone through all this stuff. And and I realize a lot of women have no idea what actually happened in the operating room. You know, we have all these great talks up front and then they're they, you know, they, they're not having intercourse during that first few months. Obviously there's a lot going on and kind of at some point, a lot of them will say, well, well, like whatever happened, like, did you spare the vagina? Like what's going on in there? Do I, do I have a uterus? You know, cause we talk about the pathology report postoperatively and talk about the lymph nodes and, you know, all these other things, but, but it's not like necessarily part of the routine discussion for us to go back and say, oh, by the way, like we spared your right ovary and we took out your left. And so I think it's really important to remember to, you know, for us as, as providers to, to revisit that and say, okay, here's what you have. Here's what we're working with here. And also for patients to, to feel empowered to ask, you know, people are so, really have, they say, gosh, I have literally no idea what would happen if I tried to have sex right now. Um, so that just kind of crossed my mind while, while I was listening to you talk, Svetlana. Yeah. And I think there's a question to follow up, Svetlana, on the vaginal estrogen. Um, are you aware of anything that would increase the growth of bladder tumors or like urothelial pro proliferation? And I would say I'm, I'm not um, because vaginal estrogen is used fairly frequency, frequently. Um, I know by my colleagues in terms of... Um, uh, as part of um, recurrent UTIs and for in other kind of situations. So I'm not aware of any data. Are, are you aware of anything like that? No. And I think that that, you know, that is such a fascinating question. I think about that question a lot. Um, and going back to your point about, um, about, you know, the data that we do have from the nurse, from the, uh, the nurses health study, you know, one of the important points is, and just like you eloquently pointed out, it's not one thing in particular, it's not one hormone in particular, it's actually estrogen and progesterone, right? Like we don't think of it like that, but it's, it, there have been different studies where they show like, okay, it's not just the estrogen that may be protective, but it's actually the estrogen and progesterone and having you know, estrogen without the progesterone may actually be more harmful. And so, um, and, and, you know, one other study that's kind of interesting is when you look at it in a completely different way, like at patients who have Turner syndrome, for example, right? One study that comes into mind, well, those women who actually have you know, one X chromosome, right? And they have less estrogen um, during their lifetime, they're actually more prone to 
um, to bladder cancer. Um, and so that's interesting, right? So it's, you can look at it at one, one particular time point. I do think that there's this sort of protective effect. And then for whatever reason, when women hit menopause, like it's almost like the cancer has been at bay and all of a sudden it's like this aggressive thing that comes on. And I have no way to prove that yet, but it, but it's coming. Um, and so to that question, to answer that question, like, well, is vaginal estrogen, is that going to prevent me from having bladder cancer? I don't know, but I know that it's going to, um, you know, and I don't think there are studies available to show that. I don't think there ever will be at this point, um, just because women, like we said, just have less common bladder cancer. So it's really hard to study these questions. Yeah, I, I definitely, um, um, I definitely agree. There's another, um, uh, question here, uh, from, from Carrie, and I think I'm going to direct this one to you, Anne. Uh, she was wondering if, um, as we know, women do have a little bit thinner bladders than men. Uh, and does it mean that the number of TRBTs that a woman can have is less? Um, and I, I'm not aware of any data that that sort of states that. I think it just means that as urologists, we're all very careful when we actually do the procedure, but if it's needed, um, those differences don't um, uh, um, stop us from going and doing the next thing. And I and there's no data that suggests that it creates more, like a more thinning down the road or any sort of issues from that. I'd be interested in what you guys think. Yeah, I would agree with you, Seema. I think it just means that from a you know technical point of view, we need to approach men and women differently, even just during something like a bladder biopsy or a TURBT and not assume that every bladder is the same as every other bladder. And so I'm always, you know, particularly when operating with residents and trainees, you know, sort of saying, okay, we got to think about like, this is not a, you know, man with a thick bladder from a prostate and, and just really try to guide the depth of the biopsy or the resection, you know, with that in mind, um, and be a little bit more ginger up front, but, you know, we know that that urothelium sort of regenerates over time and it doesn't have a permanent thin spot there per se, as far as, um, I would interpret that. And I don't think there's any limit to the number of procedures that somebody could have. Uh, Seema, can I make one more comment? Of course. All of this discussion <laughs> is just, as you'd like. <laughs> yeah. Um, all of this discussion is just making me think of a lot of things, but one, one aspect of bladder cancer care that I just wanted to point out was how important the patients are in offering their feedback and answering surveys and participating in clinical trials. And so I want to thank all of you who are on the call or who are listening for participating in, in these studies that help us understand how patients feel and respond and how their how your quality of life is, is impacted by the treatments that um, you're you're given. And so, you know, one that that come one trial that comes to mind right now is a big um, multi-institutional trial, CISTO, looking at patients who have non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and have failed BCG. And some patients go on to have a radical cystectomy in that trial. Other patients try intravesical therapies, but regular um, survey responses from patients following whatever treatment decision they um, patients choose gives us insight into the um, impact of treatment on patient-centered outcomes. And so thank you for participating in these trials. And hopefully studies like CISTO will help us understand a little bit better how we can counsel patients and help you make the best decisions for you. And I think that does dovetail into um, um, some questions that had come in even before about how can um, uh, patients and women uh, find out about clinical trials. And I think um, Stephanie will be 
so kind as to put um, Beacon's resource there in the webinar chat that kind of keeps people updated Absolutely. about calls that are available. And then um, the other part I wanted to ask you guys is the, um, how do you guys, uh, the how do support groups interface um, at your guys' institutions? Are you aware of any support groups that are specifically geared toward women? Um, and could you highlight resources out there uh, that um, that are open for anyone to sort of join. We have a support group, but it's blended group. Um, but I know that others have um, other opportunities and resources out there. We have a support group. It's a blended group, but a couple times a year I do like girls only sessions. Um, and so it's usually like twice a year that we do that. And um, they're kind of funny. I mean, you know, people are really shy, but I think the more it, it tends to be a core group of patients who attend the bladder cancer support group. And the more we do them, I think people are getting a little more open. Um, but this is kind of new. And some, some of that work has come out of Beacon inspiring me actually to, to do those. And um, I think it's been a really nice change. Um, I know that, that through Beacon, through Inspire, I think there are some women group, women's groups, and I think others on the, this may be able to speak more to that than I can. Yeah, I would say that I've been told by patients that, you know, to let my patients know about Inspire, and so I do that now, and they love it, and, um, and I always, you know, the first thing I do is I actually give them this booklet, um, which uh, I, I have like a full drawer of these. So literally every patient that comes, I give them this um, and, and they really appreciate it. And so again, this is to be Ken's um, amazing resource um, for our patients. Well, ladies, thank you for queuing up my announcement that starting the latter part of January in 2023, we will be introducing an online women's support group to really help garner information, garner the ideas about what we need to be doing a better job as an organization, as Beacon is. But then we also share this information through our think tank, our scientific meeting, and also directly with these really incredible women who are doing so much phenomenal research. So thank you for queuing that up because we will be sending out an invitation to join the group sometime after the early beginning of next year. So you'll see something right away in your email coming up because it will be here before you know it. So we're really looking forward to that. It looks like a couple more questions have come in. Um, yes, I think um, it's it's actually uh, wonderful suggestions that I'm copying and pasting on my side document here <laughs> was um, both uh, Pat and Nancy shared that uh, Sibley Hospital at Johns Hopkins also has a, um, a women's support group that has been really uh, helpful. So yeah, absolutely. And that's headed up by um, Armin Smith and Jeannie Hoffman census. So you have both the urology perspective and the medical oncology perspective. And I'm really delighted to say that Karen Sachs, who is on this call, happens to be an oncology nurse. And she also happens to have gone through muscle invasive, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, and then also had the pain and privilege of taking care of her husband as he went through muscle invasive bladder cancer, and she will be moderating our support group. So we're really thrilled that she'll be doing that, but we'll send out some announcements in the next week or two, just so you have that on your calendar and you can join us. But I think, you know, obviously sharing your concerns with these wonderful people on this call are really going to help change the landscape for bladder cancer for women going forward. So we really appreciate your input. I know we're um, going to be closing down in just a minute, but I do want to remind you any suggestions, any other thoughts that you have when you get this survey at the end of today's program, make sure you drop those in there because that's really going to be beneficial to us as we begin to plan for 2023. So doctors, do you have any closing comments? Anything you think women should pay attention to? 
Well, I'll always have a closing comment of some sort, I guess. You know, I mean, I would just say, say, look around and make sure you find a provider you're comfortable with. Um, you know, there are a growing number of female urologists and female urologic oncologists scattered around the nation. And, you know, if just because you're a female patient doesn't mean you need to go to a female doctor, but there are lots of options. And if you have friends or family members who are not, you know, finding somebody who's talking to them um, about options and only talking to them about sort of what they have to do, that might not be the best provider. <laughs> and so I think that, again, just look around, know there are options, um, you know, um, it for something particularly, I think like a cystectomy, um, it, you know, it's worth it to travel a little ways if you need to, to find a provider you connect with. And this is a lifelong relationship that you have with your doctor. I see my patients forever after a cystectomy. And so you want to find somebody who you think is going to be like on your team and, and there are people out there. So look hard and, and, and find a connection that makes sense to you. And thank you so much for your participation in the, in the, um, webinar today. Dr. Porton, do you have anything else? I would say that um, keep keep out there, keep at it. Um, uh, make sure you share with your um, providers questions, experiences. I would say I learned as much from my patients as probably probably more than <laughs> than I can um, teach them or help them through their journey. And so these these are all amazing, important questions. I've already from the conversation and that I've like, oh, we got it. We have a couple things that we have to add to our um, uh, teaching documents and, and some of our information booklets and maybe some things to look into um, mm -hmm. in terms of trying to answer some of these questions. So I would say stay engaged. Um, you guys can do this. You can make it through this journey and still have a joyful, productive life. And so um, that would be my my closing comment. <laughs> Dr. Avilova and Dr. Scopato will get to you in just a second because there was another question because this is a topic that's very relevant to our research community about the microbiome and gut bacteria. And there was a question that came in, is there anything about women's gut bacteria that plays a role in how women process treatments? Um, or is this a topic that, wow, we need to do more research on that? What are your thoughts? I would say that we need to do more research on this. However, <laughs> and, and um, much of it's being done, some supported by Beacon. I think the early um, stages of this are, are um, being investigated. I know of probably four or five projects across from uh, different institutions, primarily um, at Fox Chase um, by Dr. Bukovina. And I think that happens to be Beacon funded as well. And so um, I would say it's a really interesting uh, question with some very strong roots in science, borrowing from other, other cancers. And I think it remains to be seen um, how much our gut bacteria affects how we um, uh, respond to treatment and also um, how we develop um, disease. And Dr. Bukovina, another female urologic oncologist who I think is a force to be reckoned force to be reckoned with and is doing some really exciting work. Mm -hmm. I will just add for my closing comment that it's an exciting time for bladder cancer. I've seen again in my relatively short career a large amount of resources and energy being shifted appropriately to bladder cancer and even more recently into women with bladder cancer. And so I think the future is bright. There is a lot of exciting discussion, research, support, and I'm very optimistic about where we get with bladder cancer and how our female patients um, end up doing, particularly in, in important areas that we haven't always focused on, like sexual health after cystectomy. Right. Yeah, I mean, I would just, I would echo everyone's comments. I would say that um, there's still a lot of research to be done. And I think the most important questions we get are from our patients. And so keep up the, keep, 
keep bugging us with questions because we need to figure this out. Great. Well, doctors, I will share all of the questions that came in with you because I think that is something that we get an archive of. So I'll share that with you as well. So if that sparks your thoughts for future awards, that's a great idea. And we really look forward to you know, seeing you again on other programs. Thank you so much for your time. We're really delighted. This was a very different format for us. And I hope everybody really appreciated you know, this nice dialogue with experts who also happen to be women talking about women and bladder cancer.